I remember when I was about six or seven, I was coming out of my classroom to go home and uh, one of the boys came out of the music room playing a trumpet and I just remember seeing this sort of blast of light in the shape that was like a, almost like a cliche image of an exploding sun you know but with lots of sort of spikes coming out everywhere and in changing shape and, and quite bright. I immediately went home and told my mother I, I needed to play trumpet. I always had this very playful, fantastic imagination, was always telling fantastic stories. I half believed the fantasy stories I would tell, they were sort of real for me all the time and I tried to make them as real as I possibly could. Some of the things I would explain were completely absurd, but then I would also describe, you know, the, the shape of a particular sound or the colour of a day or the, the space of time. I think people just accepted that I I explained things in this fantastic way. The kinds of sounds that provoke the strongest experience of synesthesia are very ordinary sounds, I think. I think it really is quite related to space because what, what's happening, I realize when I, I listen to sound, is that I get a sense of the the space around me changing and therefore creating a sensation of, of objects or shapes that move as the sound changes. The first thing that I hear when I wake up in the morning is uh, an alarm and it creates these sort of small circles but they're like little stains um, like if you were to put a little droplet of bleach onto a piece of paper. Some things like when I feed the cat, all of the biscuits that the cat eats hits the plastic ball and that creates a sort of sense of little tiny, um, almost sand grains. Chopping vegetables that sort of sound of the knife cutting through the fibers of a vegetable creates quite a fascinating shape. Chopping of ginger is uh, like a little small kind of sphere or ball would appear and then, then pull apart uh, with lots of little tentacles coming off in between it. When I'm wearing headphones, because the sounds are right there, being thrown in my ears, I kind of get a feeling of the sounds and their shapes sort of poking my inside of my ear as if they're sort of bouncing around inside my ear physically. Often I, I realize that the movement of something, you know, obviously creates a sound and that movement dictates the way that the shape moves around me. A sound that's created by a, a circular movement, you can hear how it goes up and down and kind of goes further away and comes back again and therefore the shape that I experience does similar things. It, it gets bigger and smaller and it, it moves in a sort of circular or spiral way. I started using um, representations of sound in my art the moment I started creating art. Two, three years ago I started uh, working on this project called The Shape of Sounds. I would develop a, a large-scale painting using different materials to try and 
create a kind of a visual landscape of my experience of sound. If I didn't experience synesthesia, I would listen to things differently. The shapes wouldn't appear when I heard sounds and therefore I wouldn't stop and think about them. It helps me engage more profoundly with my environment and how I experience that environment, how my brain, my person translates the environment. I'm really interested in when people were born and how old they are. I think that's maybe just because I can kind of, I know how to pinpoint it in my head and then I can kind of line it up with where everybody else is and where I am. I guess people who don't have synesthesia, they still think of a year, but they just don't have it cemented in their mind. Like when I think of 1934, I know exactly where it is. And I think that helps me remember the ages of people One of my friends a few months ago got some new folders. She got one that was bright yellow and she said, oh, Emma, this is you. And I did think, oh, it is, because I, um, I was born at 7.07 .07 p.m. and I weighed seven pounds and seven and a half ounces. So I think of like, when I think of my birth, it's very yellow because seven is a yellow color. Spatial sequence synesthesia is a way of perceiving ordered sequences of numbers like dates or years or times. The structures in my head are basically formed of kind of intersecting lines and they are all different colors that correspond to the colors that I have for each number. When I think of a date, I don't think of it in terms of a calendar or something that is just an abstract idea. I think of it in terms of a form that's more like a landscape that you can kind of move around and view. From where I'm standing right now, um, I'm standing parallel to the 2000s and the 1990s and the 1980s, which are a step down from that. Diagonally angling to the left and downwards from the 80s are the 70s, and they are bright yellow. And then um, meeting up with that are the 60s, and they are pink. At a 90 degree angle from the 50s are the 40s, and then directly behind that are the 30s. The 20s, they are lined up like the 30s and the 40s, and they're dark blue. But then the 10s, they trickle into the early 1900s. The whole 20th century, I don't know why it is, maybe because it's more immediate. They all are very distinct each decade. My synesthesia really affects my memory positively. The fact that I can remember dates kind of by their colors helps me a lot. I'll, I won't remember what the day was, but I'll remember that it was a yellow day. And then I'll think, oh, then it must have been the 17th. And then I can kind of plot that into the week and then kind of more fit it into the month and then maybe even fit it into the year. The fact that I have something going on in my head that is pretty unique and distinctive, it's nice. It's like having something that nobody else does and that is kind of a comfort. I mean, it's just another way that I'm different from everybody else and that everybody else is different from everybody else.
when I was younger, um, as a family, family unit, we used to move around quite a lot. I was born in Manchester, we moved down to London. Um, I spent some time living up in Glasgow, and then moved down to London again, then up to, uh, to Blackpool. All of my memories of all of those places are dictated by the taste of them and the taste experiences I had in them. Glasgow, for some reason, carries very strong taste of, uh, of condensed milk. Blackpool, I mean, one of the reasons I moved there was because I quite like, the, uh, quite like the taste of it. I quite like saying, you know, I live in Blackpool. It doesn't matter what the flavour is, but I mean, that's its defining feature. Most of my memories, that's, that's, that's how they come to me. They come to me as a taste first. And when I go on a car journey, that car journey is defined by a series of tastes. My likes and dislikes of a place or a, or a, a, a stop on a journey would be dictated by the emotional pull of whatever taste that place gave me. I used to go to work on the same route every day, and tastes were all the same. If there was something missing, uh, say maybe a building, had, been knocked down or something or I might see a bright yellow car one morning if something alters it tends to alter the entire perception even a tiny little thing and then it's just somewhere different London itself to me is um, it's a city of extreme tastes and textures I mean I get off the train at Euston <laughs> I come up those long stairs, I get a, a really weird taste there, something like, it's like wall plaster, I've never known why. When I go out into the concourse and then I hit the noises, especially when I go outside, it, it's just very, very overwhelming. It's just the red buses, for example, I can't believe how many red buses there are, and the way they contrast in with all the, the whiteness of the buildings. Every time I go on a tube train, that, that's a really weird one. And I remember this from, from being four and five because I used to go on a tube to go to school. Um, I get such an intense taste of rhubarb whenever I'm on a train and it doesn't matter what's being said to me, it overrides everything. There are certain, certain lines I like the colour of rather than, than others. Circle line gives me a taste of toffee. Piccadilly line gives me the taste of peanuts, chocolate. It's just like a, like a sweet I used to have as a child, I think. My problems with cities is the uh, is just the, the cacophony, all the noise, all the colour. I hate it simply because it leaves me feeling vulnerable. Thinking back to, um, from, from growing up up until now, the world itself, as far as I'm concerned, synesthetically, has got a lot more difficult, it's become a lot more difficult place to live in. It's become a lot more colourful, a lot more image conscious, everything's got to have a visual impact. It's a very noisy world now as well, uh, it's got very, very noisy which is why I surround myself in silence, because there's less, less intrusion. Synesthesia has often been described as, you know, like taking drugs, and to be perfectly honest with you, with you, it is exactly the same, because you can get that spaced out with it. If you decide to fall into it, then it just totally takes you, and then you, your head starts spinning. Listening to music is, um, 
really, really nice. Music makes up a huge portion of uh, probably my psychic uh, experience. Whenever I listen to a song that I've heard before, I always associate it with a specific place. I kind of just get a flash of what the, where I've been when I start listening to the song. It has a kind of a, a golden sense of color, like little sparks coming off of it. There's an instrument playing in the background which is giving me this constant um, taste of, of this chocolate taste. It's a bit like the chocolate you get on the top of biscuits. I'm in the car and I'm angry and I am, it's the summer after first year of university and I'm driving um, and it's dark, it's night time and I'm by myself. Uh, it's like a, a bunch of sort of shaking, um, kind of like tentacles um, and little discs that are, are kind of moving around each other in a circular way but sort of bouncing at the same time. And um, right now I'm, I've just turned off onto, I'm passing Turtle Lake and I'm turning back onto 63. Um, and it's all, it's all sweet taste. There's uh, something very similar to runny marzipan, and p pineapple chunks. Oh, but, mm. but then I got, I got a bit of onion that sort of went in, so I was concentrating on that. I got a bit of onion in there as well. Sort of strings weaving uh, into each other, around each other a little bit. And I'm passing St. Joseph's Hospital and the Minnesota History Center is on my right, and I'm kind of going around a curve to the left. Then there's the sound of sort of a hammering, and with that hammering, um, you have a sudden sort of appearance of a, a kind of flat um, plane, but kind of circular, and it, it has like little slivers or little bits that come off of it. There's an example of it, but it's really nice. Now it's, uh, there's a section in this that's producing that onion taste. It must be a, an instrument they're playing, but it's producing that onion taste, which, that's gone there. This was, when was this? It was Thursday the, the 14th. It's, I don't know, I'm kind of feeling melancholy, but for no particular reason. Almost like a bunch of little s smoke puffs, but quite hard. Um, and they kind of appear um, and move off and fade away like, like a trail.